This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 71. Coming up on Space Time. A dead star caught ripping up its planetary system. New research suggests that Mars may have retained a significant amount of its water until far more recently than previously thought. And Russian space debris threatens the International Space Station. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have been given a sobering glimpse of the ultimate fate of planet Earth as they watch the sun-like star at the end of its life rip its planetary system apart. It's the first time astronomers have observed a white dwarf consuming the violently disrupted remains of its planetary system. And distance doesn't mean safety. The dead star is siphoning off debris from both the system's inner rocky metallic and outer icy bodies. The findings help describe the violent ultimate fate of planetary systems when their host stars die. But because these planetary bodies are being pulled apart, they're also providing information on the makeup of planets for astronomers. Very much a case of a celestial post-mortem examination. The findings are based on analysing material captured by the atmosphere of a nearby white dwarf catalogued as G238-44. A white dwarf is the remains of a sun-like star after it's run out of fuel to maintain the nuclear fusion process which makes stars shine. The star's outer layers expand away from the stellar core and eventually separate completely, floating away as a planetary nebula and exposing the white-hot stellar core, a white dwarf, an object about the size of the Earth which is now doomed to slowly cool over the eons. This will be the fate of our own Sun and Solar System in around 7 billion years from now. The study's lead author, Ted Johnson from the University of California, Los Angeles, says scientists have never seen parts of both the inner and outer planetary systems accreting onto a white dwarf at the same time. By studying these events, astronomers hope to gain a better understanding of planetary systems that are still intact. The findings are also intriguing because it shows that other planetary systems also contain small icy bodies, similar to those which crashed onto the early Earth, bringing water with them, an essential ingredient for life as we know it. Johnson says the makeup of the bodies detected raining down onto the white dwarf implies that icy reservoirs may be common among planetary systems. One of the study's co-authors, Benjamin Zuckerman, also from UCLA, says life as we know it requires a rocky planet covered with a variety of elements, including carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. The abundances of the elements that are seen on this white dwarf appear to require both a rocky and a volatile-rich parent body, the first example of its kind found among studies of hundreds of white dwarfs. Theories of planetary system evolution often describe the transition between a bloated red giant star and a white dwarf as a chaotic process. It seems the star quickly loses its outer layers and this in turn causes its planet's orbits to dramatically change. One of the consequences of puffing off so much outer material from the star is the gravitational scattering of small objects like asteroids and comets and moons by the remaining large planets. Like pinballs in an arcade game, the surviving objects can be thrown into highly eccentric orbits. The wayward planets end up getting very close to the host star and experience powerful gravitational tidal forces which quite literally tear them apart, creating a gaseous and dusty disk that eventually falls onto the white dwarf surface. The study confirms the true scale of this violent chaotic phase showing that within 100 million years after the beginning of the white dwarf phase, the star is able to simultaneously capture and consume material from all areas of its former planetary system. Though astronomers have recorded more than 5,000 exoplanets orbiting stars other than the Sun, the only planet we know of where we have some direct knowledge of its interior makeup is the Earth. So white dwarf cannibalism provides a unique opportunity to take planets apart and really see what they're made of when they first formed around a star. As part of their observations, the authors measured the presence of nitrogen, oxygen, magnesium, silicon and iron, among other elements. 
The detection of iron in very high abundances is evidence of metallic cores of terrestrial planets, planets like Venus, Mars, the Earth and Mercury. But the unexpectedly high nitrogen abundances tells the authors that they were also seeing the presence of icy bodies, bodies you'd normally expect to find in the outer solar system beyond the so-called snow line. Iron metal and nitrogen ice each suggest widely different conditions of planetary formation. Johnson says the best fit for the data is a nearly 2 to 1 mix of mercury-like material and comet-like material made up of ice and dust. This is space-time. Still to come, new evidence of long-standing water on ancient Mars and Russian space debris threatening the International Space Station. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new study suggests that Mars may have retained a significant amount of its water until far more recently than previously thought. The new findings are based on clay mineral deposits, which indicate the presence of water over a period from roughly 3.8 right through to 2.5 billion years ago, far longer than scientists had previously calculated. It might even have been sufficiently long for life as we know it to have developed on the red planet, if it ever did. The findings, reported in the journal Icarus, are based on data from NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft. The study's lead author, Catherine Weitz, from the Planetary Science Institute, says the data suggests a region on Mars may have been repeatedly habitable until relatively late in Martian history. There's plenty of evidence in the form of dried-up riverbeds, river deltas and seashores to show that Mars was once a warm, wet world. But as the red planet's core solidified, it lost its protective magnetic field. And without a magnetic field to shield it from the sun's solar wind and cosmic rays, the atmosphere was gradually eroded into space, and with it, much of the planet's water. The result is a freeze-dried desert we see as the Martian landscape today. Some of the most extensively preserved landforms on Mars, created by running water on its surface, are found within the Margaret Tiffert Terra region, where vast deposits of clay-bearing sediments have been identified. Veit says the presence of clays indicates an environment favourable for life. That's because clay forms and remains stable under neutral pH conditions, where water persists long-term and minimises evaporation to form other minerals like sulphates. Weitz and colleagues found that the land and basin region within Margaret Tifatera records a long history of flowing water beginning relatively early in Martian history, around 3.8 billion years ago. And it continued up until at least 2.5 billion years ago, which is considered relatively recent. The authors used orbital images to identify clay-bearing sediments within northern land and valleys, southern land and basin, and the southwestern highlands around the basin. They found colourful light-toned layered sediments that contain clays which stretch for some 200 kilometres across the basin and which may have once been part of a lake. Veit says the clays initially formed in older highland terrains around land and basin and then subsequently water eroded through these clay-bearing highland materials to produce the land and valleys channel and then deposit sediments downstream into a lake within the land and basin and northern land and valleys. This report from the Planetary Science Institute. In the past 20 years, orbiters and rovers have brought us an unending string of evidence that Mars once had water that could have meant habitability. From seeing now dry riverbeds to finding minerals that can only form in liquid, most scientists are ready to agree that Mars once, long ago, had water. But this isn't to say there isn't controversy. We still don't know if Mars had long-lasting seas that might have supported the evolution of life, Perhaps water was only transitory, raining down repeatedly with impacting meteors and comets before rapidly slipping away. This question, how long did the red planet remain wet, is now the question being asked by researchers all across our pale blue dot. In searching for answers, PSI senior scientist Catherine White went looking in the Martian dirt. Using orbital images, we identified clay-bearing sediments within northern Ladon Ballas, southern Ladon Basin, and the southwestern highlands around Ladon Basin. Here on Earth, we have learned that our world's history is recorded in layered rocks, with global events leaving their mark in every outcrop in the world. 
By studying these sedimentary layers deposited over millions of years, researchers can identify local phenomena like floods and fires and spot catastrophes like volcanic eruptions that spread ash around the planet. The same science that allows us to understand our Earth, the study of sedimentary rocks, also works on any other world that has weather, including worlds like Mars. Modern Martian weather deposits dust, sand, and ices on the surface, but deeper layers show us that the past was much less boring. Image analysis by Weitz and her colleagues revealed stunning deposits from the past that included clays and the kinds of rocks, called mafic rocks, that are rich in magnesium and iron. Some of these minerals, like the clays, required water to form. The distribution of these materials, particularly in the Ladon region, is consistent with water that stayed long enough to shape the world. Colorful, light-toned, layered sediments that display relatively low bedding dips and contain clays across 200 kilometers in distance are evidence that a lake was most likely present within Ladon Basin and northern Ladon Ballast. The low energy lake setting and the presence of clays support an environment that would have been favorable to life at that time. The late Noachian is one of Mars's geologic periods. It's Mars's own version of the Paleozoic we had on Earth. And like on Earth, it was a time marked by abundant surface water and abundant meteor strikes. This era stretched from about 3.7 to 3 billion years ago. Over time, our worlds diverged, with Earth remaining a wet, warm planet while Mars became the frozen desert we see today. This transformation took place during Mars's Hesperian to Amazonian period, which stretches from about 3 billion years ago to today. Weitz's team looked for landscapes that could define when Mars was wet and water flowed, and when water's fluvial forces changed the landscape. We found that the Ladon Basin region within Margarita Fertera records a long history of flowing water beginning relatively early in Mars history, around 3.8 billion years ago, that continued until up to 2.5 billion years ago, which is considered relatively recent. To understand these images, we have to understand the processes that build up Mars's surface and then erode it back down. From the building up of clays to the impact of asteroids, multiple factors all played their own important roles. The clays initially formed early in Mars history, perhaps when there was water on the surface that could alter volcanic rocks into clays. The Holden and Ladon basins formed by large impacts very early in Mars history, and there could have been hydrothermal activity resulting from these impacts that would have formed some clays in the region. Materials also had to form in the right places to take advantage of the wonderful water, and water, like so many other things, flows downhill. Ladon Basin is a giant crater with highlands and mountains surrounding a lower, flatter floor, and the water flowed down from the highlands towards the floor, producing all the valleys that surrounded the basin. After the clays formed in the highlands, water eroded through the highlands and carried the clay-bearing sediments downstream where they were deposited into the light tone layer deposits we now see from orbit. And clays aren't just a cool, complex form of dirt that you can turn into pottery. Clays are also environmental stabilizers and a place where nutrients can be found. Stability, nutrients, water. These are also the things of life. The presence of clays indicates an environment favorable for life because clays form and remain stable under neutral pH conditions where water persists long term that minimizes evaporation to form other minerals like sulfates. The lake setting and presence of clays within Ladon Basin and northern Ladon Vallis point towards an environment that would have been favorable to life at that time. At this point, we can't actually go fossil hunting on Mars. But that possibility is no longer a sci-fi dream. The work of Weitz and her team helps us understand where the conditions, water, clays, and minerals, once could have supported life. They have told us that these conditions could have even existed for over a billion years. Now we just have to wait and see which rover or human gets to go fossil hunting first. This is space time. Still to come, Russian space debris threatens the International Space Station. And later in the science report, claims the Omicron variant of COVID-19 is less likely to cause long COVID than the Delta variant. All that and more still to come on Space Time. (music) 
The crew aboard the International Space Station have been forced to take evasive action in order to avoid a piece of Russian space junk created by Moscow's latest anti-satellite missile test. The crew undertook a 4-minute, 34-second engine burn of a dock Soyuz Progress MS-20 cargo ship to maneuver the orbiting outpost out of the way of the widely tumbling remains of the Russian Cosmos 1408 spy satellite. Cosmos 1408 was a Soviet electronics and signals intelligence gathering Selna D spy satellite launched in 1982 from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome and designed to monitor and detect the location of NATO radio emitters. It was destroyed by Russia in a deliberate anti-satellite missile test on November the 15th last year, which generated a massive cloud of shrapnel, polluting the orbit and creating a massive space navigation hazard. The Russian anti-satellite missile test created an estimated 15,000 pieces of additional orbital debris. It follows similar tests by Russia, India and China, all of which have been strongly condemned by spacefaring nations. This is Space Time. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with StuartGary.com. Spacetime's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial-free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group, and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetime with stuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Bytes.com.